I have Dr. Chris Palmer here, Harvard psychiatrist and researcher, and we're going to talk about the brain. But uh, first, Doc, what did you have for breakfast? <laughs> uh, I had three eggs and turkey breast. Right. Very similar to mine. So mine is usually <laughs> eggs with uh, locks, usually just the same nice. thing. Yep. So uh, before we dive into things, we're going to talk you know, about insulin resistance in the brain. We're going to talk about just metabolic health in the brain and, and mental illness and a number of things. But can you give the audience, those watching, just a little background on who you are and what you focus on? So I am, I've been a psychiatrist for 27 years. I've, uh, I do a lot of different things. I direct um, education programs at Harvard. I have done neuroscience research and I have always been a clinician and the patients that I treat tend to have treatment resistant mental illnesses. So they tend to have either chronic unrelenting depression, suicidality, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, substance use disorders. Most of the people that I work with have numerous diagnoses. They've been seen by multiple psychiatrists. They've usually tried dozens of meds. They've been in therapy for years or decades. They've even had shock treatment, nothing's working, and then they come to me. Got it. All right. So to put it simply, I mean, you see people at their absolute worst, the absolute bottom of depths of despair when they're really struggling. I see the people that other mental health professionals have given up on. That's powerful in and of itself. Now, how did you stumble across sort of the idea of metabolic health and mental illness in the first place? I want to mention I popped a 30% off discount link down below for Thrive Market. Now, Thrive Market is an online grocery store, but it's not like a regular grocery store. It's set up by different diet categories. Okay, so you've got keto, you've got vegan, you've got paleo, you've got different diet categories. So it allows you to get the best quality foods, okay, no preservatives, no garbage. You can stock up your whole house, not just your pantry. They have sustainable meat and seafood options, so you can stock up your fridge. They're working on really cool options as well. So you're looking at just everything you can get in a store, essentially, that's going to be in frozen or in the regular section, delivered to your doorstep. And with this link, you save 30% off your entire first grocery order plus a free $50 gift. So I've also created my fasting bundle, which is things that I recommend people get for breaking their fast and also for sustaining their eating period with the right kind of foods. So that link is in the top line of the description right below this video. I definitely recommend you check them out. They are a sponsor on this channel, but they have been for like five or six years now. And it is definitely where you want to be going as pretty much your one-stop shop, almost entirely your one-stop shop for what you can get delivered to your doorstep for your intermittent fasting routine. You know, the, it's a long, like 20 year story, but it really started with my own personal story. I, <clears throat> the very quick version is, you know, I struggled with mental illness when I was a kid. I actually had metabolic syndrome by the time I was in my twenties, even though I technically wasn't overweight. I found my way to the, at that point in time, it was called the Atkins diet, found my way to the Atkins diet, got rid of my metabolic syndrome within three months. The thing I noticed was dramatic improvement in my mood, energy, concentration, sleep. It was, it was so much better in a way that I had never experienced in my entire life. I went on to recommend it to friends and family. They started getting benefits too. Within a couple of years, I start using it in patients with treatment resistant depression. Lo and behold, it works for some of them. For some of them, it worked very powerfully. And the thing that really upended everything that I knew as a psychiatrist was when I helped a patient with schizoaffective disorder, which is a cross between schizophrenia and bipolar. I helped him lose weight using a ketogenic diet. And I really only wanted to try to help him lose weight. I had no, I had no notion that this would do anything for his symptoms. Even though I'd been using it in depression for a long time, in my mind, depression and schizophrenia are supposed to be totally different illnesses. And lo and behold, not only did he start losing weight, but you know, within a couple of months, his hallucinations were going away. His long-standing paranoid delusions were going away. This man went on to be able to do things he hadn't been able to do since his diagnosis. He was able to go out in public, not be paranoid, 
able to perform improv in front of a live audience, able to move out of his father's home. And that sent me on a journey to understand what the hell just happened. Interesting. Now, if we kind of start to flash forward a little bit and you start diving into this more and understanding potential mechanisms, and like, there's obviously a big, big correlation between a lot of these different mental illnesses and our metabolic health. Was there sort of an aha moment as far as metabolic health goes where it just kind of clicked? Like, I mean, I'll, for example, with me, it was the physical side of things with my body, just learning that, wow, you know, like when I am utilizing ketones, I feel like I run better and something just clicked with me because that's what resonates with me. Everyone kind of has this aha moment where like, aha, this is what's, this is what's clicking. This is why this is making sense. Was there, was there a moment like that for you? The moment really was as a scientist because I had experienced it personally, so I kind of knew it worked but I had no idea why. And I was seeing it work in depressed patients, but that was just kind of like so-so. When I saw it work for schizophrenia, that's when I went on a deep dive into the science to try to understand what on earth happened. The first aha moment that I hadn't even really understood at that point was that the ketogenic diet stops seizures, even when medications don't. And we use epilepsy treatments in psychiatry all the time. And so this is a hundred year old evidence-based treatment for epilepsy and like hardcore academic neurologists use it to stop seizures in the worst of the worst patients that aren't getting, aren't responding. So that was the first aha moment. And then that led me to all of this neuroscience literature, helping me understand what is the ketogenic diet doing to the brain to stop seizures. And it turns out all of that is highly relevant to people with serious mental illness. The next aha moment was when I could finally start to connect the dots. Because I'm like, but wait, keto is a weight loss diet. But wait, keto is like being used for type 2 diabetes. What the hell do those things have to do with mental illness? The more I dove into the science of, well, what exactly is type 2 diabetes? Like what causes it at the cellular level? What causes obesity at the cellular level? Like, how are those things connected? And how are those things, how are those two things connected with mental illness? That, that was probably the biggest aha moment is it, all of that led me to these tiny things in our cells called mitochondria that helped me understand metabolism and metabolic disorders. But it also, for the first time in my career, helped me understand mental disorders and I could start to connect the dots. So is it almost just a level of understanding proper substrate utilization just across the board and just understanding sort of, hey, like what's happening here in the body is also happening here in the brain. And we just have this almost natural thoughts as humans to separate the two. When in reality, there's very similar things going on cellularly here and here as far as glucose metabolism is concerned, fat metabolism is concerned. So was that sort of the common denominator? Just understanding, hey, wait a minute, like if we can help the brain utilize fuel properly, or was it more so the inflammatory side? Things like, what was sort of the common denominator there? That's the thing. So the common denominator actually gets really complicated. So the common denominator is mitochondria. But when you do a deep dive into the science of mitochondria, this field has exploded over the last 20 years. So most people know mitochondria as the powerhouse of the cell. Mm -hmm. they, they take food and oxygen and they turn it into ATP or power. And they do that, but actually they do way more than that. And that is the cutting edge area of research that helped me connect the dots. It turns out that mitochondria play a direct role in neurotransmitter production and regulation. Hmm. Like neurotransmitters like dopamine and serotonin. It turns out it plays an important role in inflammation, turning it on and off. They play a role in the regulation of gene expression in the nucleus. They play a role, here's the thing, they play a role in the human stress response. Psychological stress, trauma, adverse childhood events. They play a role in helping the human body orchestrate the stress response to defend itself, to help you fight or flee, to help you cope with adversity. 
But it turns out adversity also has an impact on mitochondria and mitochondrial function. And once I understood all of that, that was the first time in my career that I could start to say, whoa, this is like the missing link. Because we know all of those things play a role in mental illness. And this is the way to put it all together. Very interesting. So when you look at uh, someone that's dealing with, let's just, for simple terms, let's just, let's just talk about depression. So we're, we're not going too wide because we can do other, other topics surrounding you know, other mental illness. But when you look at depression, for instance, so is it the additive component of ketones being present or is it sort of the subtractive component of lowering glucose or is it sort of GKI or that glucose ketone index that matters and those glucose ketone index is essentially the ratio of glucose to ketones but is there one and I don't mean to put you on the spot with this but is there one if you had to pick one that's more important is the additive you know histone deacetylase inhibition effect say of ketones or is it more so hey we just got to get glucose management under control or is it a little of both both of those play a key role, but the really big money that I think the ketogenic diet is doing is it actually stimulates two things with mitochondria themselves. So it's not only that it provides fuel for mitochondria so that the mitochondria can function better and so that those cells can function better, but the ketogenic diet actually stimulates mitochondrial biogenesis, which is the production of more mitochondria in your cells. And I actually think that is where the real money is at. Because when people, are, when people do the ketogenic diet for a while, their cells end up having more mitochondria and those mitochondria are healthier. And at the end of the day, that helps them regulate neurotransmitters. It helps them regulate hormones. It helps them regulate gene expression, inflammation, all of the things that are associated with metabolic disorders and mental disorders. If mitochondrial DNA is damaged and you have mitochondrial biogenesis occurring, could you argue that it, it can replicate it in a, in a negative fashion? Do you wanna kind of have a period of, hey, like ketogenic diet having its positive effect as far as uh, that effect from a DNA level, sort of the gene expression level, and then have that biogenesis? So I guess in other words, does someone really need to do it for a while before they really get these long-term changes? They do need to do it for a while. At least the patients that I work with who have serious brain disorders, the serious brain disorder is giving us a signal that they have really messed up mitochondria somewhere in their brain. And that is gonna take some time to correct. It's not just gonna correct itself right away. The beautiful thing about fasting intermittent fasting and, the, and a fasting mimicking diet, which can be the ketogenic diet. And there are some other versions that go by other names that are also fasting mimicking diets. But the beauty of that is that when the body is in a fasting state, your mitochondria actually play a key role in all of that. The healthy mitochondria fuse with each other and they form these tubular networks that help the body cope with the fasting state, those defective mitochondria that have mitochondrial DNA mutations, they don't because they're defective and then they get recycled. That's the beauty of it. The healthy mitochondria stay healthy and protect each other and stay protected. The defective ones get go out and get recycled. And then when the person starts eating again, new mitochondria come in. So it's kind of like mm. cleansing out defective mitochondria and replacing them with fresh ones. So is there a potential argument for saying, hey, let's do this for a period of time and then have the occasional sort of mTOR spike to spur new growth? So almost as if, if someone is seasoned enough, and I can use myself as an example. I was, uh, you know, I've been keto for, I guess about 12 years and out of that, um, you know, about five or six years of it, it was straight, straight keto, right? Until I got to a point where I kind of added some carbs in, kind of Mediterranean flair here and there. Most of the carbs when I do have them are coming from polyphenol rich fruit anyway. So it's usually pretty, pretty low, but I've noticed that, hey, like I maintain the benefits seemingly psychologically because I've gotten huge benefits psychologically. I suffered with, you know, depression a whole lot in my twenties uh, and it's maintained 
even with carbs being reintroduced into my diet, albeit I'm not putting crap in my body. I'm very responsible with my carbs and I'm careful to make sure that I still kind of dip my toe in the water and go back ketosis now and then and kind of keep almost like a maintenance, maintenance on my cells. And I think that's a question that probably a lot of people watching or listening probably have is, is they, they almost get concerned that like, hey, well, keto's worked for me. Uh, you know, if I do have some carbohydrates or I do reintroduce other foods, is it going to erase everything? And no. So it, that's the beauty of it. So let me give you the hardcore extreme example too. So when this diet is used to treat seizures, people who have treatment resistant epilepsy, their seizures aren't stopping. They, it's not a life, it's not a lifelong diet. They do the diet for anywhere from two to five years, repair their mitochondria, and then the neurologist usually tells them, go off the diet. And, and usually most people can maintain those benefits. Somebody who has a, maybe a less severe brain problem, like mild depression or moderate depression or something else, probably doesn't even need to do it for two to five years completely. They, they could probably get away with less than that. And then do it exactly as you said. Like do, do it intermittently, spike it with carbohydrates or other types of dietary patterns. If you've got a goal of, I want to build muscle, I need more energy or I need an insulin spike or I need something, do that. And then if you notice that, oh, my mood's starting to slip, like I think I've been on this or I went way off the wagon, like I had those carbs and then I started craving all the junk food. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now I'm off the, I'm off the plan, but, but I'm okay because, you know, I did keto for two years, so I'm, I'm good. That's actually fine. But as soon as you start to notice problems, as soon as you start to notice that depression coming back, you know how to, you know how to correct it. Get back on the wagon, do the plan again, get your symptoms under control, and, uh, and, and, and go on with your life. I think you, you nailed it. And people, like, they, they, they have this problem, like I mentioned it before, differentiating between the body and the brain. And obviously two very different things, but at the same time, as far as the mitochondria is concerned, very, very similar. And I noticed, for example, you know, years of doing a strict ketogenic diet as an endurance and as a strength athlete that does both, um, with or without carbs, the amount of mitochondrial density that I have developed as a result of being so strict keto and being in this fat adapted state while also concurrently doing endurance work, while also strength training. When I do go back on carbs responsibly, my body knows how to utilize them significantly better because I have, for lack of a better term, more powerhouses. Uh, and I think that's where if people can take that analogy in my example, so to speak, and apply it to the brain, People think, okay, well, if I come off of ketosis, if I come off of a ketogenic diet, my brain no longer has the ketones to run on as fuel. And I, I usually caution them, like, that's not necessarily what's happening. You're not, it's not, the increase in the brain energy isn't just a sole result of the presence of ketones because you could remove those ketones and still have tremendous improvements in how your brain is literally utilizing energy. But a lot of times it takes explaining the body to have that click in the brain because we just, again, as lay people, it's like we just have this like compartmentalization and we think everything that happens in the brain is a bunch of electricity and a bunch of different stuff and that's all. And then the body is a bunch of cells and a bunch of biology and that's it. Yeah, no, I, I, think, I think that's absolutely right. That insulin resistance in my mind is a sign that a cell is metabolically compromised. If you do a ketogenic diet and other things, so it's not just the diet while you're drinking a lot of alcohol and not sleeping and not exercising and smoking cigarettes. Like that's not, that's not gonna cut it. So you gotta do the whole package. You gotta do the whole lifestyle. But if you do that, your cells are gonna be metabolically healthier so that they can handle carbohydrates, they can handle any food, they can handle splurges. If you go on vacation with your family and everybody's eating junk food and you wanna join in, just if nothing else for the social aspect, everybody's giving you a hard time. Come on, you gotta, come on, you gotta have some cake. You gotta have a cookie. Grandma made a cookie or something. You gotta have grandma's cookie. Okay, go ahead and have grandma's cookie. If it's gonna make grandma like really happy, <laughs> go ahead and have her cookie. Your body can handle it. Um, 
again. And then if that makes you go off the wagon and now you're eating cookies every day for the, for the next few months, you're going to notice, okay, my energy is declining. My mood is getting worse. The brain fog's coming back. I'm not as sharp and focused at work. Okay. I need to like get back on the plan. Well, and, and another way that people can do this is I've encouraged people if they're coming off of a ketogenic diet and they want to implement carbs. I mean, some of that can simply be offset by implementing fasting as well. I mean, you're again, talking about common denominators. I mean, some of the same common denominators are there minimizing glucose, elevation of ketones that you can get through fasting while also a ketogenic diet. And yeah, you know, that's, that's how I maintain a level of fat adaptation for lack of a better term, even when I'm not on a ketogenic diet per se is yeah, I might, if there's the more carbs that are in the, my diet, the more I implement fasting. And that's sort of my carbs are sort of my barometer for how much I should fast to try to offset that. And when you're doing it for a long period of time, it's kind of funny. You can't really put your finger on it, but it's almost like you have just this inherent sense of how much is too much and how much is not enough. It's like, I know we were talking before we have cameras are rolling. Like if I have more than 200 grams of carbs, even if I am squatting 300 pounds for 30 reps for 50 sets, it's like, it's just that number just is too much for me. Right. And, uh, that's where I think more work needs to be done in terms of people understanding like, yeah, we probably have predispositions to, you know, at a genetic level of, are you a better carb oxidizer? Are you a better fat oxidizer? Um, I have an interesting question for you that you may or may not, not, not know the answer to. And it's something I talked to uh, Dom D'Agostino about. I know you're not an epigeneticist, but this is, you know, I did a lot of endurance work when I was a young kid. When I was, I ran my first marathon when I was 11. And prior to that, I was running a bunch of half marathons. I did a lot of endurance work as a young kid. And I wonder if at an epigenetic level, if it sort of pre-programmed me to be very good at fat utilization. And hence why when the ketogenic diet came to me, it just clicked. Like it was just tremendous. Uh, and this may or may not apply to people, but I do talk to a lot of people that are endurance athletes that just naturally the keto diet just works for them. I don't know if you have any background there or any curiosity there, but it's just something I've always wondered. I would, I mean, obviously I'm speculating, but I would actually speculate going even further back hmm. that you may have been born with epigenetic or genetic predisposition to having trouble using carbs as a fuel source. Ah. When you started doing long endurance, you got a high from it. Self-select. Not everybody gets a high from it, but you got a high and you probably felt like, I feel great. This is something I want to do. I almost crave it. I need, I want to go farther. I want, and when you're going farther, you're clearly when you're running a marathon, you're definitely putting yourself into ketosis and you're definitely burning fat as a fuel source. There's no way around it. You're also stimulating mitochondrial health at the same time. So when you were younger, you may have noticed that just running long distances improved your health. And that's why you gravitated toward it. That's why you liked it. That's why you thrived doing it. And then if that went away for a period of time, I'm not surprised to hear that you started noticing depression and other things. And then when you found that again, through a ketogenic diet and exercise, it's like, I'm whole again. Like I'm, I'm firing on all cylinders. I feel great. This is, I can't imagine being any other way. Like, why would I, why would I go through life less than? That makes perfect sense. That's, I haven't thought of that. Yeah. It's in a way it's self-select. It's like, this just felt good. So I did more of it, you know, and it's, I wonder what would have ever happened if I was never exposed to it. You know, thanks to my, my mother for pushing me into that at a young age. It's like, had I not, you know, a lot of kids don't ever get the opportunity at a young age to run long distances. And I just fell in love with it. Um, we can go fairly deep into some science if we want to. We have a fairly, very intelligent audience that is really into this stuff. And they're pretty keto savvy in a lot of ways. Um, as far as how, if someone is suffering from depression uh, at, a, at a clinical level, like, what have you noticed in the research 
is potentially happening metabolically? Is it just an inability to utilize glucose properly? Is it an inability to form the proper neurotransmission? Is, uh, what's going on there? So what I'm arguing, you know, right now the field doesn't know. The field just says, oh, there are all these things, you know, inflammation, neurotransmitters, hormonal imbalances, maybe some epigenetic changes. Um, the gut microbiome plays a role. How that all causes depression in the brain, most of the leading scientists will say, no one knows, it's too complicated. What I'm saying is when you understand the science of mitochondria and metabolism, you can actually connect all of those dots. And mitochondria and metabolism are controlling all of those things. They're controlling neurotransmitters, hormones, inflammation. The gut microbiome is communicating with your mitochondria and changing metabolic rate in your cells. And so the simplest way to understand depression is, I, I have to take a little bit of a step back and say there, I'm gonna say there are two types of depression. There's normal everyday depression that everybody gets for obvious reasons. If you have somebody that you deeply love who dies in a tragic accident, you're gonna be depressed. That is not a disorder, it's not pathology, it's not your brain malfunctioning, it, 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 it's you being human. And we need to distinguish that from a brain disorder. And I think some people get depression and it is a brain disorder. And that means that they are depressed for no good reason. And they can say like, I don't know why I'm depressed. I've got a good life. I've got a, I've got a loving partner, or spouse, whatever. I've got a good job, I've got kids. I have no idea why I'm so depressed. I don't know what's wrong with me. Those people, I would argue, have a brain disorder. And what I'm arguing is that those, that brain disorder is due to metabolic dysfunction somewhere in their brain. And if we can restore the metabolic health to that area of their brain or the entire brain, their depression will go away. Are you starting to see preliminary evidence of exogenous use of ketone esters or even salts in some ways having, having an impact as well? Or does it really need to occur at a deeper sort of transcription factor level in terms of doing the diet to really implement the change? You know, some researchers are studying exogenous ketones for all sorts of conditions. Um, I've used exogenous ketones clinically and have not seen them work in a powerful way. However, they can augment the ketogenic diet. So if somebody's doing a low-carb or keto diet, or if somebody falls off the wagon and needs like a rescue, they can play a role. But for the most part, I think the diet is doing a lot of things that exogenous ketones aren't going to do. The diet is changing your gut microbiome. It's, it's reducing your insulin and glucose levels, so improving your insulin signaling in your brain. It's decreasing inflammation. It's doing all sorts of things. Whereas if you're eating donuts and cookies and chips and then just drinking some yeah. ketones, you're still gonna have insulin resistance, you're still gonna have a messed up gut microbiome, you're still gonna have high levels of inflammation, you're gonna have all of those things mm -hmm. from the crappy food that you're eating. And arguably going to make it worse because then you're getting into a category of overnutrition where you're having hyper amounts of, of two things that are in excess yeah. at that point. The ketones are just extra yeah. calories at that point. And I don't think there's a large enough cohort to really study people that have you know long-term ketogenic dieters that then go back onto carbohydrates and simultaneously use ketone esters. That might be a subcategory of people there. Yeah, you might get an additional energetic effect, whether it's a healing effect or not, that remains to be seen. But you know, if you're already fat adapted, yeah, then maybe you're someone that in tandem for exercise or for performance can get a benefit out of the dual usage of, you know, because that's a, that's a non-existing natural physiological state to have you know, insulin as well as ketones present. Like usually those two things aren't happening in tandem. So when it does in the state of, a, of an athlete, and uh, again, I, I talk a lot to, to athletes and from a performance side of things with the use of exogenous ketones. So I was curious if there was much in the brain because I candidly, like, unless I am in a fat adapted state at a specific time, taking exogenous ketones doesn't give me a huge boost in brain function. Uh, but I do notice a decent improvement in body function and how I can perform and whatnot. Um, 
And you might be a good person to ask this question because this is something that I've always wondered. As far as brain energy, which is, happens to also be the name of your book, <laughs> yes, uh, that, that, was a, that was not on purpose, but also on purpose. <laughs> I've had a, so when you go into a ketogenic state, obviously your glucose isn't going to zero. Obviously the brain is a glucose hog and uses a lot of glucose. Um, is the peripheral insulin resistance that's happening throughout our body, is that partially responsible for the increase in like network stability and brain activity that we get because we're allocating more glucose to the brain? Are we oxidizing more glucose in the brain? And could the ketones hypothetically be there as an anti-inflammatory to sort of combat the extra reactive oxygen species that comes as a result of extra glucose metabolism? Or are the ketones specifically fueling very specific cells and the glucose fueling specific cells? The real answer is that we actually don't have great research to answer that specific question. It's a very specific question. And no, and no it's, a, it's, a, it's an important question and it's one I've asked myself a lot as a researcher and I've gone digging and that's why I say I don't think we really have a definitive answer. The answers that I've been able to come up with are that some cells in the brain, it's not even exactly clear which ones, but some cells in the brain or some areas of the brain appear to require glucose and cannot use ketones effectively. So that appears to be true. Even when people are doing a ketogenic diet, so one, really good study that helped address this was uh, looking at like an Alzheimer's disease model in humans. And what they found was that when they were on a ketogenic diet or using exogenous ketones even, the amount of glucose being used by their brain remained constant, but the ketones added extra energy. So the, so the way I think about it is not you know, I know a lot of people will say the brain loves ketones. Ketones are the preferred fuel for the brain. That might be true. I'm not convinced that it is. I'm really not convinced that it is. Instead, the, the thing that I think is definitely true that I feel absolutely comfortable saying is that if you have brain cells that have trouble using glucose as an energy source, probably because they have defective mitochondria and or probably because they have problems with insulin resistance or insulin signaling in the brain. Um, the end result of either of those is that that brain cell is not fully fueled. It's not running on all cylinders because it can't use glucose effectively for a fuel source. When you add in ketones, that brain cell, it's a lifeline to that brain cell because that brain cell is like sending out distress signals, send me more fuel. And that distress signal is actually stimulating the liver to increase glucose levels. That's why people with type two diabetes have skyrocketing glucose levels. The signal is often coming from the brain. The brain is telling the liver, send more fuel. What are you doing? Send more. Keep it up. We're dying here. Like we are really struggling. Unfortunately, the brain cells can't use that fuel source. So that's the beauty and the magic of ketones is that when you send it ketones, those ketones can be used as fuel source. Those brain cells finally start firing on all cylinders. They calm down. They stop sending out the distress signal and that can help reestablish metabolic health. There you go. Yeah. Then you start having this homeostasis that kind of comes back and yeah. And, and as far as a fuel that can get into a cell easier, get into the mitochondria easier, ketones are significantly easier. There's less, you know, you just have CPT1 and I mean, just a couple other little transport mechanisms versus it's, it's a much more complicated orchestra for glucose to get into a cell, albeit glucose is an easy fuel to burn if you're metabolically healthy, but yeah, you're basically taking a backdoor entry into the mitochondria versus the traditional route with glucose. So it's like all of a sudden these cells that have been uh, not dormant, but misfunctioning and misfiring, you know, all of a sudden they're like, holy crap, we got, we got fuel we can use. 
So it's probably why a good portion of people that are metabolically dysfunctional, uh, when they go on a ketogenic diet, they do want to shout from the rooftops because all of a sudden they, let's just, I mean, a very random number that is by no way like a scientific number. You know, they just unlocked 20% of their brain that's been messed up before, right? So it's, or whatever percentage, right? It's just, and again, whether it's theory or, or fact or whatever, people are feeling clearer. And you take like, you know, an example, like my, uh, my father-in-law, my wife's dad, it's just, you know, he's very overweight. He went on a ketogenic diet. Sure, he lost weight, but you know, he is someone that had kind of suffered with depression, went through a rough divorce, and it really just kind of catapulted him into just a dark place. And it really turned him around. And it was like, he was like, wow, I just, the conversations with him changed. Like his tone, his went from a half glass empty to a half glass full type guy, but also just, he was just having critical thinking that in 18 years of knowing him, I had never seen him do before. Like thinking outside the box, thinking clear. And so that's why, yeah, you take someone that is metabolically healthy and in good, you know, maybe they'll see a little blip on the radar and a little change. They might see some other physical improvements, but when a vast majority of us are metabolically dysfunctional, uh, those are the people that really do see such a big impact. Yeah, and I was one of those people. Yeah. It, it, it's like a light switch goes off. I mean, for me, it really actually felt like I am a new person. Yeah. I always looked at other people who were healthy and just assumed that they were like really lucky and privileged people. Like, how do they have energy to go around and play? And they, they work so hard and then they, they come home and like on vacation, they want to go running and they want to go to the beach and like swim, you know, miles. They want to, yeah. they want to, you know, do this. They want to do, like, I just want to lay on the couch and watch TV. I'm exhausted. Like, how do they have energy to go <laughs> run around? Like, aren't, aren't they tired from working so hard like I am? And when I changed my diet, I became one of those people. I became one of those people who had this never ending energy and motivation and more confidence and enthusiasm for life. It changes everything. It really does. So as sort of some takeaways for this, for I always like to have my videos be as, as practical as possible with some, some takeaways. And obviously there's very illuminating things here, but what, what are a few things that people can do to, maybe, they're, maybe they don't wanna go full-blown keto forever. They wanna kinda dip their toe in the water. How, how long do they need to do it to establish some initial benefit as far as the brain is concerned? Um, like what are some tools and tactics that they can maybe put into play? So the biggest thing, you know, I'm, as a psychiatrist, I work with people who are really suffering. And I think one of the biggest takeaways that I want to say is that right now we have a mental health crisis in the world. And depression is now the leading cause of disability on the planet. And a lot of people think if you have depression, you have to take pills or you need to go do talk therapy or you need to get your brain shocked. Those treatments aren't working for a lot of people. And that is why depression is the leading cause of disability. So one of the biggest takeaways I want to share with people is if you have a mental illness like depression and it's not getting better with your current treatments, there's a whole new world waiting for you. There's a whole new path to recovery that your doctor is probably not going to tell you about. If you decide to try the ketogenic diet, and this is the thing you want to try, I tell people you've got to give it three months. Why three months? Number one, for some people, it can take that long to really work. It usually doesn't. Usually people start the first one to two weeks suck. When you go through keto adaptation, I tell everybody this, it's going to suck. You might even feel even more depressed. You might feel weak or hangry or whatever and just deal with it. Like, let's plan for it. Let's figure out a path. But then, usually within two to four weeks, most people get an antidepressant effect. A lot of people who are keto adapted, I mean, I can get it now within two or three days. Yeah. Um, but if you're, if you're really metabolically sick, meaning overweight and depressed, and uh, you know, sleep is off and everything else, it, it's not gonna happen in two days for those people. So I tell them three months. One, it can take that long, but two, 
because most people think there's no way I could stay on this diet. After two weeks of the diet, they're still craving bread and they're still craving yeah. all the junk food that they were addicted to. If you can make it three months, that's when the magic happens because a lot of people, the cravings are gone. The benefits are through the roof. And that's when they say, you know, I kind of set out on this journey saying I was only going to do it for three months, but now I, I kind of don't want to go back. I don't want to become that old person that I was. I want to feel good. Like I feel so great. My life has changed. Everybody's talking about it. Everybody that I know notices that I'm a different person in the same way that you just described your father-in-law yeah. that like you're a different person. You're witty, you're, you're thinking, you're critical, you're like a, a critical thinker, like you're, you're sharp, you're positive. Why would you want to go back to that other person? And if you can do it for three months, that's like the turning point for a lot of people where they're like, I think I can just keep doing this. And that's mental and it's partially, that's kind of the number that I've, based upon the research, sort of looked at the, uh, mitochondrial machinery sort of shift happens to be, if you had to put your finger out, I'd probably say like 90 to 120 days. It's when that fat adaptation really kind of kicks in. And that's, you know, those transcription factors that start changing how the cell craves fuel, so to speak. So that makes perfect sense where it's right in line with sort of the emotional changes as well. Well, uh, we're going to film some other videos together, but in the interim, where can, uh, where can everyone find you? Easiest place is website brainenergy.com. Um, so you can follow me on social media there. You can actually take a free assessment to assess your metabolic and mental health. Um, it's not gonna tell you how to treat it, but it's gonna tell you where you've got maybe some problems and it'll give you a lot of ideas of what to do. Perfect, cool. Well, as always, keep it locked in. We'll see you tomorrow.